Okay, we are in the book of Acts. This is um, the 11th chapter of our text, Acts, Christianity in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, and the purpose for uh, these short videos is to add to your study. I hope things are going well for you. Once again, this is a survey course. It's very easy to just go quickly through the material, and uh, my desire is to add to that a little bit by way of inspiration and insight uh, so that this can become more meaningful for you. Acts uh, is easy to be viewed as just simply a narrative. It's just a story, but it's far more than that. Uh, like the Gospels, there's teaching, there's a purpose, there's a message that comes through the book of Acts. Let's look at that for a moment. Now, um, the history of the church has been filled with stories of revival. Uh, and we read about the Great Awakening in America and the Second Great Awakening and the Pentecostal outpouring uh, and uh, various revivals that have hit the church throughout its history. Uh, but when we look at uh, the first century and the story of the book of Acts, we find an amazing story of an explosive expansion of the gospel power of the Holy Spirit being released. It is absolutely amazing. Christianity goes from, in essence, one person, Jesus. Then through 12, it expands and uh, within three centuries takes over the known world, the known Western world. Uh, and uh, it is just a story that is well worth our uh, study and uh, emulation uh, and uh, it's just a, an exciting, exciting story of how God worked in that era to plant and expand the church. Uh, there are several themes that we need to look at in the book of Acts. Uh, one of them, and it, there's, it's lightly mentioned in your text, it is uh, the a comparison between Peter and Paul. The first half of the book of Acts deals with Peter. These two main characters, Peter and Paul. Peter's the first half of the book. Paul is the last half of the book. Uh, Acts 1 through 12, Peter is the dominant figure. Uh, chapters 13 through 28, Paul is clearly, it's following Paul. It is the story of Paul's work. Now, there are those who have taken this uh, further. Uh, the Tubingen School, F.C. Bauer, uh, so as to almost indicate two separate Christianities. In fact, dispensational teaching, some dispensational teaching today uh, uh, indicates almost that there's two Gospels. There's a Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Paul. We don't believe that. Uh, we believe that there is a unity within the book of Acts and a unity within the New Testament and the Bible. Uh, but uh, there is, however, clearly in the book of Acts, this emphasis of Peter in the first part as the apostle to the Jews, the apostle to the circumcision, and then Paul in the second half of the book of Acts, who is the apostle uh, to the Gentiles, the apostle to the uncircumcised. Uh, another theme that uh, runs through uh, the book of Acts could be summarized in Acts 1.8, which has been called a theme verse for the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 uh, says, When the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, the ends of the earth. Uh, and uh, if we read through the book of Acts, Acts 1.12, we find the disciples uh, in Jerusalem. Acts 8.1 Things expand out to Judea. Uh, Acts 8, 4 through 5, with the ministry of Philip and then uh, Peter and John, down into Samaria. Uh, then Acts 8, 26 through 40, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is going down into Africa. And then the Gentile world is mentioned, uh, Acts 10, Acts 13. Uh, so, so there's a geographic outline to the book of Acts. I've already mentioned the spontaneous expansion or increase of the church, and there are words that can be followed in the book of Acts. Acts 2.41, it says 3,000 were added to the church. Then Acts 4.4, 4, 5,000 men were added. Now, we, that doesn't include women and children, so we, the number must be substantially higher than that, but 5,000 men. Acts 5.12-14, it says believers were increasingly added. Uh, Acts 5.28, um, 
uh, there's there's teaching and there's expansion taking place. Acts six, one, the disciples, uh, as a result of the teaching, uh, the disciples it says are multiplying. New word is used. Uh, Acts six seven, disciples are multiplying greatly, and then Acts nine. 31, churches are multiplying. Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. The word is now multiplying, and that must mean the preaching of the word. Acts 16, 5, churches were strengthened and increased in number daily. Acts 19, 20, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. And once again, through the use of various words, added, multiplied, uh, increased, prevailed. We find a, an outline of the book of Acts. Uh, the last uh, theme that I want to mention uh, is uh, the expansion through persecution, and we find that at key moments, persecutions arose in the early church, and this facilitated the expansion of the church. And we find this uh, that takes place uh, throughout the history of church, and particularly the first three centuries of the church, that God would use persecutions uh, and uh, the acts of worldly powers against the church uh, to not kill the church or squash the church, but in fact uh, to expand the church like a spreading flame. One last thing I want to mention to you that you might take note of uh, is this transition from uh, Jerusalem to Rome. That's the geography of the book of Acts. And it begins in Jerusalem, ends in Rome, starts Jewish, ends Gentile. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, from a theological standpoint, uh, the movement from, of Christianity from being a subset or a sect of Judaism, merely a part of a larger sphere called Judaism, to being freestanding on its own, a faith in and of itself. And that transition takes place throughout the book of Acts. Uh, now, there are three passages for you to take note of. One is the story of Stephen, the martyr, in Acts chapter 6 and 7. Now, anytime extra time is spent on a particular story, take note of that. And we find that an entire chapter, the seventh chapter of Acts, is spent on Stephen's sermon. And it, it seems uh, somewhat redundant. He just simply tells the story of the Jewish people. And it's very detailed, Abraham, so forth and so on. Uh, but we find that the Holy Spirit and Luke, as his instrument, uh, felt it important to write down the entire sermon. Well, why is that? Well, let me read you the conclusion, or in essence the punchline, of that sermon. Uh, the invitation, if you will, the, uh, the end result. And at the end of the sermon, Stephen says these words, this is Acts seven forty seven. but Solomon built him, God, a temple, a house. He's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. However, verse 48, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. And then he quotes one of the prophets about how God fills the heavens and has made everything for himself. Uh, Stephen says this, and then he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, you crucified Jesus. And Jesus is the new temple. Now, when they heard this, they gnashed their teeth, they pulled their hair out, they screamed, and they said, Kill him. And why did they do that? Because the temple is the center of Jewish religion. And Stephen, in essence, says the temple is history. It is done. It is over. It's not needed anymore. Why? Because a greater sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, has come. It got him killed. Uh, it got him stoned. And uh, the reason why is, again, this underlying theme of the book of Acts, which is the movement from being a subset of Judaism to being a, a full-blown Christianity, Jesus, and his sacrifice, and the cross, and who he is. Another key passage is Acts 15, where we find the Jerusalem Council 
uh, meeting, and the purpose of that was to answer the question, what do we do with these Gentiles? Do they keep the law? In other words, do they proselytize into Judaism? Do they become Jewish proselytes? Do they keep all of the law? Do they become indistinguishable, virtually, from the Jewish faith? Do they come under Judaism, or do they stand alone? And the answer obviously was that they stand alone. They don't have to keep the law. A few minor details were added, but they were not called to become ritualistic Jews. The last passage that is key in the book of Acts is we find uh, Acts 20, 21, 22, to Acts 26, I believe it is, 21 through 26 that we find a detailed account of Paul's last visit to Jerusalem. He, had del- he was delivering uh, an offering uh, to the poor saints at Jerusalem, but we find incredible detail being taken as he appears before Felix and Festus, and he makes a defense, and he goes there, and they're warning him not to go. The disciples are, and, and he goes into jail, and then he, he uh, appeals to Caesar and finally gets shipped off to Rome. But a lot of detail, and uh, several times Paul makes his defense. Well, why does Luke take the time to give so much detail on this one particular visit? And the reason why is because this is the last chance for the Jewish people. This is the last declaration, if you will, the last apostolic declaration of the gospel to Jerusalem. This is God's beckoning of the Jewish people to come to faith, and he goes back to Rome, Paul does, and he preaches, and in essence, when he leaves there, uh, it's virtually over for Jerusalem within a few years. Within a few years, uh, Jerusalem will be sacked, the temple will be torn down, and uh, so the uh, detailed account is because of a reason. This is uh, God's the apostle to the Gentiles is coming back to Jerusalem to say once again, Jesus is Lord and you can receive him. Now, we are the beneficiaries of the book of Acts. As you well know, there is no amen at the end of the book. So the book of Acts, in essence, continues today. And we're a part of this great and powerful expansion of the church. God bless you.